Hey guys, welcome back to Introduction to Kotlin. My name is Tensor. In the last tutorial, we talked about some of the basic function types. In this tutorial, we're going to talk about more advanced functions in Kotlin. Thus far, our functions have returned only one single return type. In Kotlin, you do not have the luxury of tuples. However, we do have something that sort of stands in, which is called a pair. So here's an example of a function that makes use of a pair as a return type. This function adds two integers and multiplies two integers, and then it returns the actual results of both of these as a pair. A return type is specified as a pair with two integers inside of it. We can call this function by saying val x equals sum mult and then putting in the arguments. And this will give us a pair output. The printout put is inside of parentheses, so the 30 and the 200 are bound together. If we want to destruct the pair, we can do that as well. So we can say val x comma y in parentheses equals sum mult, and this will allow us to bind the first integer to x and then the second integer to y. So we get our sum as x, and then we get our product as y. So now we just print out 30 and 200, and they're not coupled together. We could go even further and add subtraction by calling a triple. So a triple holds three values inside of it, and we can use return triple with addition, multiplication, and subtraction. We're destructuring our triple when we call this function, and then we're printing out each of the individual integers. And our results are 30, 200, and negative 10. Unfortunately, there is no quadruple type or anything above triple. However, data classes in Kotlin can take the place of traditional tuples, and it'll make more sense when we actually get to data classes. So we've mostly talked about top-level functions thus far. Let's look at lambda expressions, or function literals. These are functions that are not bound to any entity, such as a class, object, or interface, and they can be passed as arguments to other functions, which we call higher order functions. A lambda expression represents just a block of a function, and we can use them to reduce the noise in our code. Lambdas in Kotlin follow a few characteristics. They're surrounded by curly braces. They do not use the keyword fun. There is no access modifier, which is something that we haven't really talked about. There is no function name, so the function itself is anonymous and there is no return type that is specifically specified because it's inferred by the compiler. Also, parameters are not surrounded by parentheses. Here's a pretty basic lambda. Now, this may seem like it's just a variable assignment, but basically all we're doing is we're assigning this execution of println hello world to the message val, and then after, we can call the message val with parentheses to actually execute this block of code. As expected, this returns hello world, we can expand our lambda by adding a parameter. So you see here we have this same val message equals. Then we have our curly braces. Then we have a message which is of string type. This is the parameter. And then we have this skinny arrow, which signifies that this part here after the arrow is the function body, whereas this is the parameter. And so all we're doing is we're taking this string and we're putting it into our hello world string and then printing it out. So again, we can just call msg with a string inside of it, in this case, John, and this will print out hello, John. We can have multiple parameters inside of a lambda. So this one has two, x and y, both of them are integers, and all it does is print out add x plus y, and then it prints out the sum of x plus y. And as such, we just call add 20 comma 30. The result is fairly predictable we get add 20 plus 30 and the sum is 50. Keep in mind that with a lambda, the parameter types can't be inferred. They must be specifically stated. Otherwise the code won't compile. We can pass lambdas to other function calls. And we kind of saw this already. So here we're creating a list of strings and it's just saying, hello there, man. And then we're calling list.last and this will just get the last element in our list. The second print ln, however, is calling list.last and inside of it, we're passing a lambda. Inside of this lambda, we're saying s, where s.length equals five. So what this will do is it will look for the last string that has a length of five, which in this case is there. So the first print ln will print out man, which is the last element. And then the second one will filter and print out the last one with length of five. We get man and there. We can clean this up a bit. We don't need the actual parentheses for last because we are just pushing in a lambda. So we can just say list last and then have the curly braces with s and then an arrow s.length. And we can go even further 
by using what's called the it argument name. So if we further simplify this lambda and replace s with it, we can remove the entire arrow part. The it argument name is an auto-generated argument. So in a way, this is sort of like the this keyword in other languages where you're saying this and it's referring to the object that you're working on. The it keyword is referring to the list that we're working on. So we're saying here, okay, it as in the actual elements of the list that we're iterating through and it will see which one has a length of five and then grab the last one. And as expected, we still get man in there. It is a fairly useful keyword to know and we'll see a lot more examples of it as we're going forward. Let's look at anonymous functions. So an anonymous function is another way to define a block of code that can be passed to a function. It's not bound to an identifier and it has no name. It's created with the keyword fun and it contains a function body. So lambdas are technically anonymous functions, but more traditionally, a, an anonymous function looks something like this. So we have a list here of integers. So one, two, three, four, and five, and then we're calling list dot for each. We have a function call here. So it's actually a function. And our parameter that we're passing through is n. We don't have to specify the type for n because it's automatically inferred for us based on what we're calling this on. We're checking to see if n mod two equals one, and then we're printing them out with odd and then n being the element. And as expected, you can see that that is in fact what happens. We could also write this entire expression using a lambda instead of an anonymous function. And we're able to do this inside of Kotlin because we have the it keyword. I just removed the fun n and then the n from in here and replaced it with it. And of course our output hasn't changed. So there are various reasons to use anonymous functions versus lambdas and vice versa, but I won't go into the finer details right here and now. So here's an example of a nested set of functions. We have two function definitions inside of this function, and then we actually call those functions inside of this function. And this circ and area function takes in a radius, which is a double, and then we define a function called calc circ. This takes in a radius, which is a double, and then outputs a double. And we just take two, multiply it by math.pi, which is pi 3.14. And then we multiply all of that by our radius, which gives us our circumference of our circle. And then we say val c, which is the circumference, equals, and then we put a string in here, which is percent.2f, because we only want our double to have two decimal points. And then we use the format method that's connected to the string type. And then we call our calculate circumference function on our radius. We do the same thing with calculate area. The only real difference here is the function body, and you can see that our result is fairly predictable, so we get our circumference and then our area. Using nested functions, or what's called local functions, which are the functions inside of the outer function, can help make our program more modular. All of the functions inside of another function have access to the variables that are defined inside of that function. The radius argument that's being passed into our circ and area function has a scope that starts from here and ends all the way here. So these two functions have access to it and that's why we can pass it in as an argument for both of them. But this doesn't actually work the opposite direction. Only returned values are accessed by the outer function. So I've mentioned a few times that everything inside of Kotlin is an object and this kind of leads us to the next type of function that we can create. Extension functions allow us to add behavior to objects without actually having to inherit the object and create a new class. So here's a fairly simple example. We take the object of string from Kotlin, which is also a type, and then we add a function to it called uppercase first letter. And this function then takes our string using the this keyword. So this refers specifically to the string that we're calling this function on. And then we're getting so the substring of 0, 01, which is the first letter of this string. We're calling to uppercase on that. And then we are adding it back into our substring starting at index one. So we're taking the first letter off, we're making it uppercase, and then we're putting it back together with our string. I can call this function directly on a string literal. This will then take our hello, take off the H, and then make it uppercase. And that's exactly what happens. I've created an add function. Now I'm not calling it add because add is already a method method that's included with the integer type. So I can take 50 and call add on it. And inside of it, I wanna add an X and a Y. 
50, which is this, will be added to x, which is 40, and y, which is 32. And we get 113 as our result. Now this also kind of leads us towards our infix keyword. This allows us to create functions that can be called using infix notation. So here we have our add function, but instead of having two parameters, we only have one parameter. So we're just adding the integer that we're calling this on to x. I'm calling it on 15, and even though I'm not using a dot, Kotlin already knows when I put AD in between 15 and 100 that I want to reference this specific function. And this is how most of the mathematical operation functions inside of Kotlin are actually made. 15 add 100 is basically just 15 plus 100 and the same with 50 dot add 10 we get 60 and 115. Okay, so now let's look at a few more advanced examples. This function multiplier is what's called a higher order function. It takes in as a parameter a function and it also outputs a function. So we put in a integer and b integer and then op is a function that takes in two integers and outputs an integer. And then the return type is a function that takes in an integer and outputs an integer. So we also have this add function, which we're going to actually pass to our multiplier function. But we can invoke this multiplier function by putting in first a and then b and then using double colon and putting in add without any parentheses. And we can do this by binding multiplier to a value x and then running println on x with a value inside of it. You have to remember that our lambda that we're returning also takes in an integer, so this needs an integer to multiply the result by. So higher order functions do not necessarily have to return and take in a function. They can do either or. A higher order function is just a function that either returns a function or takes in a function or both. In our case, this one is doing both. Here's another example of a higher order function. So we're using our calc circumf and calc area functions, and then we have our circle operation function. This is a little bit different than what we had before, but our circle operation function takes in the radius, which is a double, and it takes in the operation, which is our function, which takes in a double and outputs a double. And then we are just outputting a double from this function. So we can pass in both calc circumference and calc area into this function. Also, another thing to note is when we're passing our function into another function, the reason why we're not putting parentheses at the end is because parentheses signify that we want to run that function. We're not actually running the function until it is put inside of our other function. We get 62.83 and then 490.87. The last function type that I want to talk about is a recursive function. Kotlin does support recursion, and in fact, it supports tail recursion, which is a technique where the compiler can rewrite a recursive method in an imperative manner. Tail end recursion requires the recursive call to be the very last call of the actual function. So here we have two recursive functions. This one here is not actually a tail recursive function. And the reason why this top function is not a tail and recursive function is because we are actually multiplying n by the recursive call. So we want that multiplication to happen earlier, and that's why with this one we're actually passing in a second variable called akum. This akum variable allows us to basically execute this multiplication before we make the recursive call. We can actually put a tail rec keyword before our function so that the compiler knows that it's tail end recursive and so it will properly optimize the function. Both of the functions work quite well. I've put in 10 for both of them and we get out the same exact factorial number. The main reason why we want tail end recursion is to avoid what are called stack overflow issues. Most of the improvements that we get from tail end recursion come in the form of performance. Simple recursion is much more expensive than tail end recursion. In fact, if we were to call our factorial of 51 million times without tail end recursion, it would take us 70 milliseconds. Whereas if we were to call it with tail end recursion, it would take us 45 milliseconds. So yeah, that's kind of a big deal. That kind of cuts the execution time in half. Anyway, guys, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you dislike this video, then by all means, downvote it as much as you'd like. Have a good night, guys.